folks welcome back and today i'm doing monthly reflections that's right i am trying to jump back in a little more regularly it's strange because i do still differentiate the type of content i put on youtube for, from everywhere else i find it a lot easier to share and discuss aspects of myself and my practice and just show up on instagram so I'm a little hesitant about my return to YouTube because I've always felt like it's not a full, not that it ever is for anyone, but just in terms of what I do share on social media openly with people. I don't feel like YouTube is a full representation of what I do show, of my practice, of my beliefs, of my ethics, all of those wonderful subjects that are intertwined with our you know our very being and our craft i don't know that my videos here are entirely a great reflection of that and yes you could argue that i could do something about that bearing in mind i now have a patreon as well so between that and instagram youtube's kind of a side fun thing not that the others aren't fun, um, but I just feel like the others are more whole and that this is kind of like a, an add-on. So I really want to put that out there. Certainly, if you're intrigued and you're on Instagram, then yeah, that's, that's a better reflection of my practice as a whole. However, I do feel like the return of monthly, they're really monthly rambles, but monthly reflections is a nice way to just share a little bit of various aspects of my practice with you and to catch up really. Before we dive in, I would like to say that my patrons, they're a monthly fave. They really, really are. That's kind of a given. Everyone who runs something, whether it's a course or a Patreon or whatever it is, I'm sure feels exactly the same. So if you are watching, thank you, thank you, thank you for hanging around and supporting me and being a part of our intimate community over there. May for me was a bit of a strange month. I had a hospital procedure that was meant to be a standard kind of in and out thing. And um, it actually ended up being incredibly traumatic just more painful than I possibly more pain than I've ever experienced actually to date it really was quite something surreal anyway that process really really flared my conditions up um, especially my endometriosis which was unfortunately aggravated by the procedure and um, they found loads of adhesions and my body has just been <laughs> screaming from the inside out and what I found happened in May, and it's still, I'm not going to lie, very, very intense in terms of that, is that May was quite slow for me in that each day I didn't try and fill it with too much after that. May went past very quickly, but each day was quite gentle, I suppose. It wasn't a particularly nice month until it got towards the end and the sun has started coming out and the animals and the flowers and spring when the weather sort of meets what I view as spring and the plants and, and the animals are sort of everything's aligned. It has a significant impact on just my mental well-being. I underrate it every year. And also because my body doesn't like the cold, anything where it starts to warm up is beautiful. So it's been a really lovely end of the month, but just a strange one. Everything that I have done, however, has felt particularly intentional, which has been really, really nice. And I'm looking forward to showing you some bits. So without further ado, let's jump into the decks. I'll start off with my two staple decks for the month really quickly because I'll be honest, I didn't pull anywhere near as many cards as I usually do and I really just wanted to show off the bag before I showed you the deck but this is the my second edition of the Brady Tarot. This deck is just does something for me that so many other decks don't that it's 
probably going to bore people to tears how often it will, if I carry on with these videos anyway, how often it will keep coming out because when something speaks to me, I do become, I suppose, quite hyper-focused in a sense, but very just keen to use it and get that um, intimacy with it because that, that brings me a lot of joy. I'm by no means like a deck minimalist, but I do go through really big phases of spending time with just a few. And I suppose it's why I like to keep the amount of decks that I have to where I at, you know, where I am at the moment. Plus, I just really love the artwork in this. I feel like Emmy tapped into something that speaks to me on a, I guess, a very core level about the way that I approach nature. And of course, because that's such a big part of my practice, that then makes a lot of sense to me and feels very familiar and feels very comfortable, even in the uncomfortable presentation, because that is that is how nature works. And the deck that I chose to use with the Brady Tarot was my first and second edition of the Oracle of Oddities, which, as you know, I do tend to use a Black and the Moon deck at any given time because... <laughs> because I'm obsessed. I don't use that term lightly. And I fancied giving the oddities a bit of a spin. I am looking forward to meshing it with the Memento Mori as well. Um, I find it hard to split my time between those decks because <laughs> I always feel like I want to use them all, but I'm, I'm trying to be more specific with not mixing it so so regularly and so spending a little time with the oracle of oddities and then i'll probably change it out for the memento more they do actually feel very different to me from each other and i'd hedge a bet that most people will probably feel that way if you own both another reason i stopped calling this favorites actually and i went for the term reflections is because and i'm not suggesting that um the things that I show in these videos don't end up being favourites or I don't fluctuate between how I feel about things because I do but some of the things that I show I merely want to sort of discuss because they're a part of my month but I wouldn't necessarily consider them up there favourites and this is one of them this is the Green Witch Oracle by Sherilyn Darcy look at those backs it's not that I don't like this deck I take the word favourites quite seriously actually and it's not quite there um, but I have enjoyed using this and I did use this a lot, especially in the first half of the month. And the reason being is Rockpool kindly contacted me and said about sending me a few decks. I had done it in the past, but I, I'll be honest, I don't like being sent decks that I would otherwise never have any intention of getting. It feels wasteful to me. I would rather someone else was sent that deck. So I come to an agreement with them, told them a few decks that I liked. This was one of them. So I was very interested in the Green Witch Oracle and I spent a lot of time with it. I read the book. I used it a lot just behind the scenes for myself. And it's a really beautiful deck in terms of cultivating a relationship with the plants that are in here. It's really intentionally separated into elements. The, the fruit are water, for example. I think the herbs are fire. It is a really lovely deck. One of the things that I struggled with, however, I am not, not really able to garden and I don't even have like a little raised bed that I can work with at the moment. And also I've been on a really restrictive diet because of some of the issues I've been having. And when I think that some of the food aspects of this, um, it, it was just not the best timing to extend the deck into that kind of use. And that's one of the things that really appealed to me about this deck. So there's a lot of potential for that, but I just didn't get time to do a lot of it. I do love how it supports you being able to learn how to grow the plants and how to utilise them. There was a discussion of what Green Witch is, and I did mention this in my review. My reviews at the moment are on Instagram, they're written reviews. So if you're curious, it's over there, I'm afraid. It's not a video one, but essentially I didn't 
feel that the discussion of what Greenwich was was very inclusive of those of us who are differently abled but the discussion of it is so brief and I'm also not massively one for labels but actually this is I you know ignoring that one introduction page which it's a tiny couple of sentences in it it's a really accessible deck in terms of supporting you to understand the plants and it's 44 cards which was really nice because I know with Rockpool they will commonly do less than that and I tend to steer away from decks that are less than that. Then I've got two new decks and this one is the Curious Cat Club which is actually a mass market copy of Stasha Burrington's Magic Nico deck. And this came out super silently, as far as I'm aware. I do follow their Instagram account, and I didn't see any discussion of it. I I could be wrong. But anyway, this is super affordable. And whilst I am really trying, uh, well, and succeeding to not spend money, um, this was a little gift from my partner because my hospital stuff just went like, ridiculously wrong and yeah I was the I don't even want to say walking wounded because I wasn't walking very well but uh this has been on my wish list for the longest time I was going to get the indie copy I found out there was a mass market copy by accident and it's so much fun it really really is I think that there's a lot to be read from these cards. It works really well for me as an oracle. And the only changes are one card that's completely changed. And then a few of them, they've had these backgrounds added in just to give a few more of the cards some extra colour. If anyone's wondering about the differences. But I'm having a lot of fun with this deck. I love cats. I enjoy it reading from images and just completely going wherever it takes me out of structure because I enjoy the tarot structure it's nice to have a break from it as well and yeah it's just fun there isn't much more to say about it also I do play solitaire with it as well because I'm sad and I enjoy that the other new deck is the Pacific Northwest Tarot and this is created by Brendan. If you are wondering why you have not heard of this deck, it is because this is a prototype and I was sent this for feedback, review, promotion, all of those kind of good things. I've been following his work as he's been creating it and was really besotted with this deck anyway. So when I was approached to do that, it was a big hell yes in that instance. And it goes to Kickstarter on June the 8th. And I've done a full sort of second impressions walkthrough discussion of some of the cards on a video that was uploaded before this. So if you're really curious to see more of it, then go and check it out. But I'm really enjoying getting to know this deck. There's some really interesting animal choices in here. Whilst I love animal decks, I am fussy and i have to really sort of especially over time i have to really feel like the person put them there intentionally and in that that they understand the animal's behavior but this has been really really interesting to get to know and has been why my brady tarot has sort of been less used in the latter part of the month and finally, just a little mention to the Mariel, which is sitting out on my altar and is my one that I'm pulling cards from, sort of just one card pulls randomly. I would like it to be more regularly this month in June than it was in May um, because I'm getting to know the deck. And the Queen of Discs came out for me a whole host of times in May, which considering I didn't pull from it that often, was really, really interesting. It's actually my favourite card or one of them in the whole deck and it made a lot of sense to me. I've been really trying to be receptive of what my body is asking me to do even though I often feel it's unreasonable because it's always in pain. I've been trying to be more receptive to others 
invitations of support and help which is something that I am incredibly uncomfortable with and still don't do it well at all um, and try and remain present in a body that really feels like it encourages me to uh, disconnect from it on a regular basis and the queen of discs or pentacles or coins or whatever you want to call it earth coming up has just been a real nice continued reminder to the point that I just I've just left it on here and yeah I am enjoying the Mary L but it's an interesting slow grow relationship I'm trying to get back into some more regular reading and I read traditional witchcraft Cornish Book of Ways by Gemma Gary again I reviewed this over on Instagram I didn't get to say everything that I wanted to say over there and maybe I'll do a deeper review at another time but if you're interested in my thoughts and they are over there I can see and agree why people feel like this is such a a treasure because there's a lot of witchcraft 101 which of course I, I would imagine that no one is looking for more help than when they're beginning so it, it does kind of make sense but at the same time even the 101 books some of them feel very uh, washed out to me in kind of depth and this really isn't that Gemma Gary writes a very intimate a very deep exploration of her particular traditional witchcraft obviously very heavily influenced by Cornwall and their sort of shared practices over there the history their myth um, folk magic is in there places of power it's really meaty and when I say that it's not just the topics that it covers it's more so that the wires are sort of answered so rather than it's like oh we do this because we do it which I find is something that does happen in books and I'm like no if anyone says to me I do this you should do it because and it's just the answer is just because basically then I'm not interested I always want to know the why's and not just because what they were told but how like it makes them feel how it shows up how they feel that this is benefiting them in their practice and I feel like that's something that Gemma Gary does very strongly in this book I guess my main critique of this book and it's only my opinion remember Gemma Gary broaches the topics in some occasion about how traditional witchcraft of course needs to evolve and shouldn't just be like a cookie cutter version of what it used to be years ago because then we're not really evolving with the land and just society and culture and all of those things and being genuine to ourselves and that's very early in the book and I was elated to read that then there are other points where she's talking about what traditional witchcraft is or talking about specific rites that sort of speak about to be a, a true witch or to be a traditional witch that you have to fit into those and and it was very much supportive of in the land you're in um, rather than just pulling from the Cornish ways and these are very very adaptable so again if you don't live in England you're not familiar with Cornwall you live somewhere else entirely whilst you know at least a good portion of this book is very much regional I would say that equally it's adaptable but when it's sort of discussed about traditional witchcraft I noticed just even reflecting on myself and the few of my other friends who have chronic conditions that there were so many things that I and they just wouldn't be able to do from this book because it's simply not in our physical capability it's not attainable it's not a reasonable request to ask our bodies so it wasn't so much like changing ingredients and things like that it just wasn't feasible and there is sort of this underlying tone at points that that's what you need to do to be a traditional witch and I'm sure that people would say well yeah that's just the case but I think that when it comes to not being physically able and in Patreon this month I held a discussion about witching when disabled and covering all of those topics including like chronic pain and incorporating people who may not feel that they're disabled but certainly are differently abled and um, we had a massive discussion about it and there were a lot of shared sentiments about how 
these books, they can't speak to everyone. It's just impossible. And I think that because it's such an intimate reflection of Gemma Gary's work, it wasn't something like I took to heart. And I think that I could adapt those things and I don't need to have the same shared beliefs anyway. I would highly recommend this book. So I don't want that to sort of shadow this at all. But it was something that I was aware of that sort of after the initial statement about adapting from sort of before ways to like now, that then sort of contradicted itself. But what I would say is there's so much again in this book that even if you don't want to adapt to that, it's so good. I really, really loved learning more about Booker, the witch's compass and the incredibly again detailed way that it spoke about was so interesting to me that it's something that I've been incorporating into my own practice upon reading it although again adapting it to my own practice basically so that was another really standout part for me the places of power the cunning tools actually inspired one of my creations so it's a freaking awesome book. I will read it again and again and probably again. I'm really glad to have it in my library. So I do really, really recommend it. Like anything, I'd be really surprised if you ever read a book where you're like, yep, it's perfect. That doesn't happen for me. It's never happened as far as I'm aware. It doesn't mean that I don't like it. It's just something that if I'm going to review something, then of course I'm going to consider critiquing it hopefully in a respectful manner so that was the that that was my feelings on the book overall and just quickly because I know that some people might be interested in what I'm trying to read next and when I say try it's because I was really excited and then realized no I need I need a couple more weeks so I don't know whether I'll finish this by the end of June or the end of July because I'm only I don't know, eight pages in. But this is The Devil's Plantation by uh, Nigel Pearson. I actually have another of his on my to read, which is Walking the Tides. And I might actually get that out and just start working with that. Because to me, that's got more of a feel of like, as you move through the the wheel of the year, if you work like that seasonally, it's a good book to just walk along with. But I am super excited to read The Devil's Plantation. The contents alone really enticed me. Nigel Pearson is even closer to home than Gemma Gary. So whilst I know that they're old and not necessarily the newest things out, I'm really enjoying reading ones that are more local to me. This is my art journal. And this is my permission to myself to make art purely for the sake of making art. And not because I'm journaling about the tarot or because I'm, I mean, it would not be this pretty anyway, but, or not because I'm doing another psychotherapy course or, you know, whatever it is, a lot of my journaling and my studying and my writing is, can get very, um, intense and I need breaks from that. Also, I can't do artwork in the way that I used to. So collage, stamping and this kind of, I don't know what, what I would call it, but I've, I've really, even as a creative person and an artistic person, it's taken me a long time to be able to do this because I felt like this was a waste of stickers somehow, or I don't know. So I haven't done too much because again, just... This is just an as and when, but as I say, we worked with turtles. So there you can see is my, I love my little photo printer. It's very fun. It's very handy. So they're really the only two I've done in this particular book. Yeah. And I've got bits and bobs. I've, I've started doing some splashy watercolors because watercolors are my new favorite thing. So this is my art journal just for the fun of it. And I'm hoping to keep it that way and not try and achieve anything with it, which is the only rule that I have. And then finally, as we are winding up, I'm going to show you the three things that, well, the main three things I crafted. This is my feather sweeper and this was inspired by the wonderful Gemma Gary and her Cornish Book of Ways. And again, you cannot see them. 
I feel like I should show you my feathers quickly. Okay, so there's just a portion, just a portion of my feathers from my foraging. As you can see, there are many feathers and I have been waiting to utilise some more of them in practice other than the ways that I already do. Not just for the feather sweeping, but as an extension of what I might otherwise do with a broom, which I, again, cannot do. This has been a lovely way to incorporate that into my practice and a lovely way to use the feathers. And what was really interesting was that it was it's common for them to use goose feathers in their feather sweepers in Cornwall. And that's exactly what I've got here, although they have um, a different a different breed by the looks of things. A lot of their feathers were white. These ironically are from Canadian geese, but they are Canadian geese that reside here all year long. They've flourished so well over here that not all of them migrate. Actually, quite a lot of them that live here just stay here all year round. And then these two little cuties, because I just didn't want to leave them out. And I was so happy to find these feathers that I had to incorporate them into something special. These are female mallard duck feathers. And I never really find duck feathers at the pond. I would imagine it's because they're so lightweight that the wind carries them or they get trodden in very quickly. But of course, the goose feathers, they're very, very heavy and uh, very large. So inundated with them. I have never found these before. I have four in total. So I added two here and I've got two on my other altar. I made this, which technically I finished on the 1st of June, but I started gathering the wood and all of those bits in May. So I'm counting this as May. <laughs> I finished it last night, but these are bits of uh, wood that have fallen in my garden. Again, I am inundated with these little sticks. I can't remember the type of tree currently, but I do have it written down somewhere. And the beauty about these is not only do they fall off regularly, they are softwood. So it was easy for me to create this without setting my hands off and causing too much sort of physical pain. And I thought I would have to ask my partner to saw off just the little extra bits because it was a bit uneven. But I managed to do that successfully myself. I just made this for the fun of it, to be honest with you. I wear a pentagram around my neck. I got it out of a, a like a witch casket box. I can't remember when that was, but I know that I subscribed to witch casket quite a few years ago, but I got a necklace in it with a pentagram on. I fell into an exploration of what it what it is as a symbol and what it can mean because that's who I am. I'm not wearing something unless I know and fell in love with it and couldn't believe that I didn't really have more of a working knowledge of it beforehand. And I have worn it to death. If you've seen a picture of me, you've probably seen it around my neck. So I'm a lover of this symbol and all that it means. And I saw people selling these and making them. And I wanted to join in because if I can find something I can still craft, after losing so much of what I used to be able to do, then I will do it. I should make some more really, but I don't need any more. And I would say, you know, why buy this from someone when you could make your own? If you can't make your own, then totally different. Um, and if you're in the UK, then by all means, get in contact with me and, you know, we can work something out. But that it was it was absolutely fun to make it myself. I am, however, on that note, very fond of supporting other small businesses in witchcraft. And there's a lot of, um, and I talked about this with witching with disabilities. There's a lot of discussion about it means more if you like grow the herbs yourself that you use, or it means more if you whatever it is. And it's got to the point where I it just makes me roll my eyes. And I don't want to feel like that because I do think it's beautiful. If you can, like if I could grow more and if I could make more and if it didn't send my body into like a tailspin freak out, yeah, I'd love it. And I'm sure it does really build a bond. 
but I don't like the narrative that it's sort of somehow you're lacking if you're not doing that. Like buying stuff from other witchy people is not the same as making it yourself or is somehow lesser than. And I find that narrative, which isn't across the board, but does come from some people, is not only a shit one and just doesn't acknowledge various other things, but perplexes me because actually there are so many small businesses in the witchy community, pagan, tarot, you know, spiritual, however you want to brand it. People go on about supporting small businesses but then on the same vein it's like oh well, if you didn't make it yourself then it's not the same or it's not as potent and I call bullshit on that personally I think that there needs to be more areas than just it's either this or this you know <laughs> there's a there's a whole rainbow out there let's let's kind of consider it all and I just feel I'm very thankful for those people who do create that stuff when I can't create it because it makes a difference. And finally, before I just start rambling even longer than I've already gone, because this is going to be a long one. This is my, I've decided to call these animal medicine altar jars. You could call them spell jars. You could call them intentional jars. I sort of go for a slightly general theme for the animals because I've got a few others planned already. I just haven't made them yet. There are more themed aspects to them. So the cat one that I've got lined up is m sort of most towards protective stuff. But this one is leopard gecko shed from one of my leopard geckos who didn't eat it because they normally eat this. So getting this is kind of not quite gold dust but it's special i have a little thing saved up of theirs and this is their medicine i suppose in the way that i perceive it but also the things that i've added in here which all of all of but one are otherwise from my garden it's all to do with regeneration and transition but in a very very gentle more sort of loving um less forceful kind of capacity and you can see like these are just to give you an idea of some of the things that are in here these are sweet violets that were growing in my garden i'm always sad when they stop growing i think they're pretty much out of season in my garden now but we'll see and I just really enjoyed making this. I'm actually making one for a friend as well. I definitely will make some more that are to do with animals that I don't have sort of shed or a whisker, you know, like there's only so many things other than feathers. I want to make a few bird ones. I will find other things, other herbs and other representations for the animal. So I don't feel like there has to be something to do with the animal in there, but what a great use what a great use of that beautiful and this is a towel piece and then just a little extra bit in there so that is my month of may reflections i otherwise spent time in the garden with my partner soaking up the sunshine it was grass cutting time which we have a compromise because i'm a little bit weird but it is very popular with all of the wildlife and I am spoilt with wildlife in our garden. I get to hang out with squirrels and all manner of birds and we get foxes come through. It's really cool. There are so many insects that I'm always finding something new that I've not seen before. And I like the grass to be left for as long as possible because we have a lot of wildflower along with moss. I'm inundated. We've got more moss than grass, which I love as well. <laughs> my partner does not. But you make compromises. And mine is that we leave it for as long as you can before, obviously, it would be too hard to mow. The animals get to enjoy all of the wildflowers for as long as possible. And then it's mow day and I go out and I sort of I guess harvest all of the wildflowers and I'll insert a picture but I harvest them pop them on my altar have my own little wildflower display on my altar or on my bookshelf or wherever and then they go into workings whether that is 
ritual workings, you know, spell jars, animal medicine jars. Basically, they get used. I feel like that's resourceful and it makes me happy. So <laughs> that is me done for this month. Sorry it was long, but isn't it always when it's mine? So hopefully you enjoyed it and I will catch you all again soon.